Welcome back to the Umucha podcast with Alexander Anderson and Didine Umanyana. Today we're speaking with Samir Zakir. He is um, he's a friend of ours. We actually <laughs> used to work together with him. Um, and he was kind enough to join us on our season two um, season finale. I know, season finale, and yeah. it was incredible. He's an amazing human being, and I loved that he said, one thing he said about it should never be a day that passes without a laughter. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're going through hardship, remind yourself uh, to laugh at yourself. Yeah, you know, and life isn't that, <laughs> that serious where you can't find at least one moment in the day yeah. to smile or to laugh and to feel the joy that, mm-hmm. you know, life can offer. Yeah, so we hope you enjoy this episode and we can't wait for you to tell us what you think in the comments mm-hmm. um, and on the social media. You can tell us about the, you know, feedback. We love feedback. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're two seasons yeah. in, but feedback is still good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now like, let's let uh, our guest speak. Do the talking. Yes. So nice <laughs> to see you. You still look the same. Yeah. You haven't aged yeah. at the all. Same. Yep. You do. <laughs> I hope so. None of us are that old enough to where like we're like hitting that point where like oh it's downhill. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like if you stay healthy, hopefully you continue looking pretty decent for a good portion of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, this has been difficult this year, right? I mean, geez. I mean, I mean, I will say I, I'm trying to be positive because this has been such a um, partially really amazing year for me, and then partially like horrible to say like it's as if like incredible things happen with really really difficult traumatic events all at once like mm-hmm. so it's, it's like difficult to enjoy the good but it's also difficult to just kind of like drown yourself in the negative because so much good did happen uh, what about you guys how do you feel like your year was <laughs> we're at the end now no yeah I, I i totally agree with that um well because i mean we don't have to speak too much on our previous employment you know <laughs> at dreamscape but uh we were let go and that kind of kicked off the beginning of the quarantine pandemic for mm-hmm. us. And the biggest thing, though, it, it allowed us to slow down a little bit and sort of just reflect and um, just think about what we've been through so far. Because I've only been here a little over two years. So it definitely wow. allowed me to to sit back and be like, OK, now I'm in Los Angeles now. Mm-hmm. I want to do this and this and that. Um, so I, and as far as the blessings are concerned, it's definitely helped us. Uh, align our focuses a little bit more and that's been uh, i don't know priceless it's been a great thing i know yeah. absolutely mm-hmm. that's incredible that i've only been here a couple of years and you you know i, I will say i i've told people this um recently and i really do mean it when i say it i feel like i would be nothing without los angeles the city has offered me so much and every year you can kind of like reinvent yourself if you want i mean it doesn't have to be every year it can be every month it can be yeah. every day yeah. but um i really like have taken it year by year and i'm like you can really try so many different things in this city and i do feel like the city has so much to offer for entrepreneurs um any any type of person who's pursuing something in entertainment politics um media any anything really that uh is creative um or business uh focused yeah. you can really do and try here and i feel like you have not only like your customer base but then you also have like your partners that you'd want to partner up with mm-hmm. you kind of have everything all in one city yes Absolutely. Um, and so i feel like two years at my two-year mark i feel like i um i definitely had some difficult hurdles but um because i feel like at the two-year mark i uh I was uh, getting off of a campaign that I thought we were going to win. And my entire life like went upside down after that because it was like some politics. And I remember I literally uh, didn't think that like the world would ever be the same after um, that loss. And so anyway, yeah. Yeah. And then you can literally, your life can completely change. So anyway, I just love the city so much. Wait, so you moved, when did you move to LA? I moved here in 2015 and um and i would say by the end of 2016 Mm -hmm. when i had that that thing happened so yeah i've been i've been living here now for five years a little under five years five years oh Oh, wow i'm the oldest here (laughs) yeah i've been here the longest i've been here for six years 
Six years. Yes, I moved. Uh, I moved here from Ro- straight from Rwanda back mm. in 2014. <laughs> By the end of 2014. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Six years. Brave. Yeah. Brave as well. Amazing. I know, and I still want to know more about your story. We never <laughs> were able to actually like go deep into it, and I hope we do. I mean, because we'll like, <laughs> that is pretty. <laughs> it's intense. Yeah. Quite, yeah, yeah. Have you read her book yet? You, you haven't got the chance to read her book. I have not read her book, but I will read it because I want to do nothing but read. But between now and the end of the year, I'm gonna just be with family. That is literally my commitment now. Yeah. Which is a good thing, and also, you know, you'll, there'll be some downtime. So I'll, I would love to read your book. Mm-hmm. I will. I will. We book. should send him a copy. We'll send well, you you're copy. in San Diego. When you're back, we can send you a copy. Yeah. And I'll just get. One. I'm sure I can get one online. Yes, you can. But we will gift it to you because you gifted us your time here on our <laughs> podcast. Uh, of so. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to read your book. That would be incredible. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's awesome. I I actually have always wanted to go visit Rwanda. You did? <laughs> yeah. Is- I've always wanted to like travel throughout all of Africa and just uh, I I'm just I've been to like a lot of countries in Asia mm-hmm. and I'm like I don't want to go back to Asia because I've done I get bored really quickly with like seeing the same thing over. Mm-hmm. And so I've always said like in the last couple of years that like Africa is the next spot where I want to like explore yeah. and COVID happened. I really really thought it would be this year. Yeah. I, I really thought it was going to be this year. Um, but yeah. yeah, Rwanda was definitely on the list. I just feel like there are so many beautiful stories that come out of there, including yours, obviously. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's it's... a lot of incredible, incredible things, incredible stories. The, the, the land, I mean, the continent itself, it's like uh, everything. You can see everything there. It's yeah. All... I'm trying to remember. Somebody that we've, we spoke to recently um, described Africa as... It's like it's its own thing. Like it's it's so unlike any other place than you've been that you've been to before. Um, it, it has its own heartbeat. I think that's what it's. Oh, whoever yeah, said it, I don't yeah, remember who said yeah. it, but they said Africa has its own heartbeat, and that it resonated with me. I'm like, of course it does. Like that, that makes total sense. Yeah, I'm yeah. taking you all guys somewhere someday after this pandemic. I'm gonna take you and t- give you a tour. Hmm. Okay. I would love that. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, we love we. I actually like that you mentioned that you've been tra- you traveled a lot in Asia. You know, you moved here five years ago. Where were you moving from? San Diego, only two hours away. San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> big move. But believe it or not, move. it is a complete different world. It is a complete different world. Um, San Diego is one of the finest cities in the entire world. Um, oh, yeah. For sure, it's the finest city in the country. It's been like mm-hmm. rated yeah. the finest city in the country. Every year, I think, for over 20, 30 years. It's, it's one of the most beautiful cities, but um, it cannot be more different than Los Angeles. There's really, it offers you beauty and that's it. Uh, yeah. There's no industry really, for, for creatives and business people, I mean, it's really, uh, it's really a small town, but it's not so small. It's kind of big, but it's, it's like a small town type mm-hmm. vibe with, um, you know, quality of life, I would say, um, but no opportunities for somebody like us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's completely different. It's as if I moved from like, you know, just somewhere like in the middle of the country, even like it's the same. And, yeah. and, and yeah. And, and then going back to San Diego now, after being here for so long, I'm like, Oh my God, how did I live here this long? Is and there's stuff I didn't know <laughs> about the city and the people in the city yeah. <laughs> that I realize now. <laughs> That's interesting. I was, yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit later down the line in terms of, um, well, I don't want to spoil the question, but that's interesting that you say that. I always thought San Diego was more of a, uh, like a mini Los Angeles in terms of uh, like it being maybe like a melting pot of sorts, but it doesn't sound like it's so, <laughs> it's as <laughs> diverse as, as you as hope. In like people, a lot of people come there to go to school. So there's like all types of people come to come to the universities and then maybe some of them will stay, but um, they're very everyday human jobs and opportunities there, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. like you won't really see like a big, you know, group of like any uh, creative industry come out there, whether it's like in the tech space or mm-hmm. anything, anything really like there's, there, you know, it's, it's not a place for an entrepreneur to, to thrive or any type of a creative person or somebody who wants to think out of the box. That's the kind of word that, that that's the word I like to use is out of the box because I haven't found a more clever word, but like, <laughs> you know, there are people who decide to do, you know, uh, 
I haven't really found a, the right word, but like nine to five type lifestyles. Um, San Diego is a great place for that, whatever it is you want to do. But I, I, I felt personally like I was constrained my entire life and I felt like I didn't belong my entire life. Oh, wow. Like I, felt like I couldn't relate to people. Growing up, I had so many friends, but I had none at the same time. Wow. <laughs> That, that happens yeah well, it's profound yeah. no that's yeah. that's i mean I, i'm from dallas and um i felt that way in a different way perhaps but it, yeah it's, it's like the the glass ceiling was very apparent you know like i, I come to los angeles to kind of grow my career and mm -hmm. you know entertainment and this and that but it's like it, it did feel um incredibly uh constricting um yeah yeah and it, it, you don't realize it until you leave and then you realize how much you grow as a person. And then you look back and it's like, exactly. Like, how am I supposed, how was I supposed to like live here for the rest of my life? Like all these yeah. people don't want to move to Los Angeles. And it's like, no, I have, there's, there's nothing there for me at this point. Absolutely. I feel like Dallas is a good example because it's similar to San Diego. It's like a big city, but then it's like not because of what it offers. Right. You know? yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. actually a really good comparison. Yeah. Yeah. And it is big. Like, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it gives, it presents the illusion that there's a lot here for you. Oh, um, right. But, you know, maybe not for everybody. You know, what? Yes. Mm -hmm. when I moved here, when I came here, I didn't, I was supposed to go to Chicago and uh, my company, I, I, I I liked Los Angeles and I had a friend in San Diego. So San Diego was like the city I knew more because I had a friend there. Mm -hmm. And I remember what I, this meeting and one woman, she's a producer, and she asked me, um, so are you going to move here, Chicago? What, 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 what's your plan? And I said, I'm, I'm thinking San Diego. And she looks at me, she's like, what? Are you going to retire? Where are you going to <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad she said that to you because you might have made the wrong decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I understand both of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me about how like every little decision we make in our lives could totally impact the rest of your life. It's so crazy because you could have gone to San Diego, you could have met somebody interesting, and you could have like gone down an entire different path in life. That, so that's true. Maybe it would have been better. I'm just saying uh, every yeah. little decision matters. Or maybe, you know, you, you definitely, I think, made the right decision. But um, absolutely, San Diego is for a place you go when you're ready to retire. And that could be early in life. But yeah. you don't, I, I don't feel like that's a city. Most cities are not cities that you go to to grow your, I don't know, some people say grow their empire, right? So, like, yes. I'm going to be cheap yeah. to use that word. You can grow your, you can grow an empire in a few different prominent spaces in the city and that's why i love the city yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely i think it's been i'm 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 like i'm grateful that i did stay in los angeles i will say uh, we and we also we had started this podcast like months and months before mm -hmm. but we we couldn't get it we couldn't like we literally will film we'll do like two episodes in, in two months yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Time really does help you get something, you know, accomplished, but you can't have too much time. It's literally the, the it's a balance. If you have too much time, you get lazy in yeah. my, in my experience. Absolutely. And I feel like if you just have a schedule and not like, uh, you know, a, 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 a long, uh, commitment somewhere else, whether that's a nine to five or whatever throughout your day, if you have just like the perfect amount of commitments, you can actually, uh, explore things that you're passionate about. So I'm glad you guys were able to finally do that. I yeah. know we were yeah. able to do that in the first three months, um, and and then after those three months, then we found another job <clears throat> that we do this pretty much the same thing, which was perfect because we yeah. we still ho we just host their web series and Instagram live. Yeah. Where influencers yeah we're influencers <laughs> now <laughs> but, yeah but it worked it balanced out to not get bored with a, just doing a podcast yeah yeah and, and it's challenging too it's challenging yeah. work and I, it's fulfilling i mean it for is me it is very fulfilling. yes it is because we, we interview a lot of people that we didn't think we'll probably meet in a real life mm -hmm. so it yeah. kind of it gives us an exposure and it gives us uh knowledge Pretty much because of what we Absolutely. talk about, yeah. Because yeah. because of what we talk about and um, we get to learn people's cultures, mm -hmm. what they do. Um, our previous guest was uh, was in a civil rights movement. She was alongside with Martin Luther King. So yeah. learning from those people, uh, it's it's uh, it's been it's a blessing. And yeah. again, like you don't you don't anticipate like when we took this job. 
Well, actually, when we started the podcast, we didn't know that we'd be offered a job because of the podcast. And then when we took the job, yeah. we weren't expecting to be able to interview these very fascinating people yeah. and just have them uh, walk us through their life. It's like, I don't know, it's, it's mind blowing sometimes when you stop to think about it. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That sounds Aww. so amazing. <laughs> Thank and you. I think that's the way you can learn is through just interviewing someone. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I, I myself also find that extremely fascinating uh, mm-hmm. to just sit down and talk to people about whatever it is. I just find people interesting. Yeah, 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 and yeah. the stories they tell. I mean, because everybody has their own, their own world. You know, we're the own, we're our, our main characters in our own stories. And then when you hear somebody yeah. tell their story, you know, mm-hmm. through their perspective, it's like, oh, I didn't think about that. So it's an infinite amount of possibilities of yeah. of the interesting amount of stuff that you can learn. And that's that's, absolutely, know, it's 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> it's great. It, I love it. It. It, is, it is really incredible. Yeah, um, like. For for example, what made you who you are? Like, what was the moment in your life that, um, I don't know, maybe if there was a moment, a specific moment that you you thought, this is what I want to do in my life? Like, was there something happened or something, a story? I don't know if there's anything that happened because I feel like something is constantly happening that's like, oh, I need to do this now. <laughs> it's a new project, really, that happens. Um but I will say when I thought about it recently, because I really had to, because I feel like I've done so many different things and some of them are extremely bizarre. Mm-hmm. Like I have taken on some interesting projects. <laughs> interesting is just a cover up word. <laughs> <laughs> the actual word is bizarre, <laughs> um, but really good. I've learned from all of them. And um, I think looking back, what I really enjoy doing and what I've made the decision to do is to just be a storyteller. So whether that means through like helping someone campaign because they're running for office or whether that means starting my own business and selling a product and telling a story through that product or whether that means, you know, creating a short film that will educate people um, on issues specifically like mental health or um, criminal justice reform or uh, just living your best life and how easy you could do that if you just help your, you know, brain health, Um, you know, or just uh, have access to resources. Um, So I think storytelling is what I realized I love doing, but I like to do it through different projects and different platforms or different businesses or whatever it may be. Um, That's like the common thing uh, through everything I've done, but did I have like a moment where I decided it? No, I was completely lost. Um, <laughs> I, I always knew what I wanted to do at the time, but yeah. throughout my childhood, I was completely lost because I was always wanting to do something new. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's my best answer to that. But I but I realized what I love doing is, is storytelling, and, and ultimately, I, I like to help people, and usually that'll be through a product or through a service or. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been kind of difficult my journey because I never I, I never took that traditional path to um, actually Dreamscape was my only traditional path because I, I was told I need to try it by a friend of mine who just made, got me the job right away. So like, you need to try a traditional path, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I tried it. And I'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, how how long was it? A month? Was it a few weeks? How 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 long did you do that traditional? <laughs> the traditional path was <clears throat> six and a half weeks. Six and a half weeks. Six and a half weeks, but I tried, okay, so the, between 13 and 18, so like five years of my life, mm-hmm. I tried traditional paths, let's call it. Yes. While I was pursuing entrepreneurial stuff, I had little businesses. I used to sell gold. Um, I, was, I was really lucky when I, when I was selling gold because it was when everything was, um, when gold was really high and everybody wanted wait, to sell. Wait, wait, you started selling gold at 13? I, I would, per- no, 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 no. So 13 <laughs> to 18, I took, um, I took on 20 different jobs. I was like, my first job was at Quiznos and then I went like, I got bored of that. Then I went to like Jamba Juice and then I became like a server. I became a server and I would lie on my applications because I always wanted to get, I always wanted to pursue whatever I desired in that moment. If I Mm. felt like it was reasonable Right. and I uh, I wanted to be a waiter, but there's no 14 or 15 year old waiters, but I I just made it happen. Like back then, you know, everything was like paper copies and they didn't, you know, you just brought something and you just showed them some kind of proof and they just accepted you and I always looked older I had somewhat of a beard at 16 <laughs> and 
you know, I was like managing a restaurant and I'm like, what am I doing? And then I would like go apply to like, I would like like a hotel, like for example, in San Diego that I thought was really like cool and prestigious. And I'd be like, I'm going to go work here. And I'd go apply for a job that you're not supposed to have until you're like 21. And I did it. <laughs> and I worked at the Hard Rock Hotel and you're supposed to be 21 years old to work there um, doing the job that I had. And I was 17. <laughs> Oh, wow. I did a lot of jobs like that. Like, I was just jumping around. Um, what drove I, you? Yeah. Huh? I'm just so curious because when I, w- I can't think of any sort of work ethic I had from 13 <laughs> to 18. That's an incredible, yeah. I, I'm like, I, all the thing I wanted to do was just, like, hang out with friends, play games, do, like, anything but h- work. Like, what <laughs> drives you? What drove you to yeah. be that um, aspirational? Well, I, like I said, in San Diego, I didn't have anything in common with all my friends. I felt like a lot of like, I, I'm just, I'm really thinking about it now. Um, my friends really did normal things, which is awesome for them. Like they played video games and, you know, people started getting into like, you know, smoking and, and whatever, at, you know, high school and, um, and, and the conversations they had, I wasn't really interested in and to me it always seemed like it was an issue i was like something's wrong with me like why am i not interested so i i I made friends with Mm -hmm. older people yeah until today i do that all most of my friends are much older than i am and i still don't understand why i feel like i might be missing out maybe not (laughs) but uh, (laughs) this one one can relate to you for sure (laughs) and see yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) all my friends are 70 60 50 you know funny is a lot of like I have some peers, I would say, like people I used to work when, when the gyms were open, I would be working out with like people my age and they'd all be going to like these influencer events in the Hollywood Hills. And I'd be going to like a democratic fundraiser with <laughs> 60 year olds. <laughs> And and and, I'm, and you know I would look forward to that, and I'm just like, damn, am I missing out on like the? I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start no. telling yourself I'm weird? What am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to then, I mean, what what made me really aspirational is I, I, I think storytelling. I just wanted to always, I loved movies. I loved stories and I wanted to make sure I spent my entire life telling stories. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I'm going to tell stories and I'm going to make up all this like loneliness. You know, I'm just realizing it right now. I realized as a kid, I must have been really lonely because I didn't like my peers mm-hmm. or the friends I had. And so I created things to keep me busy. Um, yeah. There's like a, a great strength in that mm-hmm. and independence. Like. Yeah. If you don't feel like you're not accepted by the world um, mm-hmm. or you just don't fit in, I mean, a lot of times you can just kind of fold into yourself and then just maybe get a little depressive mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. think that you're not good enough. But like it's the opposite effect with you, it seems. Yes. Like it's like, okay, well, I don't want to do this. That doesn't interest me. Those people bore me. I'm actually going to do this. And yeah. I'm very certain that I want to do this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Especially like um, having that ability, especially in this pandemic, maybe that's why you said earlier mm. in our conversation when you said there were there were incredible things happening in my life, but at the same time there were also uh, horrible things happening. But twenty twenty was not all. You know, you know, you still have that positive, you know, uh, things to share yeah. because that's how you see life. You know, like it's, um, it's never gets too dark to not turn. You know. To, for you to not see the light out of, you know, no. like you said about decisions, um, like how we choose the, the decisions we make, they change our lives completely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad he said that actually, because he said darkness. So something that's helped me with my own like mental health or just like staying well is when I, I, I can recognize when I'm in a dark place or like I'm about to get really depressed or sad or something has happened to like keep me, to, to, to take me off track from like, you know, a healthy brain space, mm-hmm. I'll recognize that. And then instead of allowing myself to like sink in, it's a real thing that I feel like people can do. Mm-hmm. You can literally recognize that it's happening. That thing is happening, that you're about to go into a dark place and literally tell yourself not to go into it and like mm-hmm. distract your brain. I do feel like it's a personal opinion. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. <laughs> just, you know but, yeah. but personally, I think that, uh, you can actually, there's a reason why we have to distract ourselves in life. We have to actually face our issues, but th- you have to stay productive and busy and distract yourself and not let yourself think too much. It's that simple. Yeah. You know, when we're in a negative place and darkness is coming, you literally can, can feel it coming on and stop yourself. And, yeah. There was a time in my life where I didn't, and, and it lasted a year of mm. just darkness. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, a thought came to my head when you said that. Uh, there's a phrase that's called paralysis by analysis. And I, I had a gap year. Like when I graduated college, um, I stayed in Dallas for a year um, and I was a substitute teacher. You know, it was, it was money. It was, you know, it was whatever. But um, what prevented me from moving to Los Angeles was this fear, this just great kind of consuming fear that I wasn't good enough or like, I don't know anybody there. How am I going to, how am I going to stay afloat monetarily and all this and that, all these legitimate fears or mm-hmm. worries. Um, but I realized, like, I don't have any work ethic. I don't have anything that's kind of uh, driving me, driving this, um, this, uh, I don't, this appetite to just continue my career in acting and in you know this and that. And I would find myself just kind of staring at the wall sometimes, like beating myself up, like I'm never going to be able to do this. And then I came across this phrase paralysis by analysis, and I was like, that's all I do when I'm not <laughs> when I'm not substituting these these third graders. I'm like. Con- are constantly just punishing myself, mm-hmm. analyzing the world, analyzing, you know, the, the ifs, uh, if, ands, or buts, you know, and that was something that I'm still struggling with or working through, I should say, yeah. but um, knowing that, uh, that it's, that it's happening, it, kind of what you just said, I'm, I'm sort of, sort of processing it right now, but it's, it's such a profound thing. Once mm-hmm. you stop and uh, can identify it. Mm-hmm. Then you're like, okay, now I'm not going to go down this dark path. I'm going to try my best to work around, you know, this, uh, this pit, this pitfall. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, one, you're not alone. And two, I do think there's so much power in just being aware, just yes. like with anxiety. If mm-hmm. you're aware that you're not having a heart attack and you're aware that it's just anxiety, mm-hmm. you'll probably get through it a lot faster and you mm-hmm. can actually convince yourself that you're going to be okay. But when you're not aware and you're just, unsure the unknown is very scary and so just being aware um i do think helps tremendously Mm -hmm. and if when you're aware of this uh paralysis analysis uh, or is it analysis paralysis i don't know i think it's the second one (laughs) Um, (laughs) yes let's go with that one uh, yeah uh I, when I heard that for the first time a year ago, I was like, dang, I'm, am I diagnosed with that? Because I for sure have that. That's right. my, that's my whole life. Literally is that. Even though I've been able to do some very <laughs> bizarre or interesting things, um, it came with a lot of like struggle, everything, mm-hmm. because I do analyze everything. Yeah. 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 So you're not alone. <laughs> no. no. Yeah. And <laughs> I can relate to everything you guys are saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's a blessing to be um, so aware, mm-hmm. you know, and to look at things critically. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there's definitely a line that you should work not to cross because yeah. it, it can be you can scare yourself. You can psych yourself out of, of doing things that you know you can do mm-hmm. or that you should do. But when you weigh all of the um, all the different ways that it can perhaps go wrong, you know, that's you know, that's not helping anybody. No, because if you focus on just what's going to go wrong, it's definitely going to take you there. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Because you want, because I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to say, um, I think it's a story she made up. I don't think it really happened, but she used to give us this, ex- this girl, a name. I don't remember the name she would say, um, that this girl's dream was to sell bananas on the street. And and her dream never passed that. She did sell those bananas on the street. So, we were kids, but she, like, <laughs> so that was her dream. <laughs> so I was always terrified to become that girl. And, and I was like, I don't want to be the girl who sells the bananas on the street. So, <laughs> <laughs> my dream has to be bigger than that <laughs> so i always felt like if i tell myself to sell those bananas i would sell the bananas yeah. <laughs> but if i tell myself to do more than that i will also work towards that and i think it helps especially with, like the phrase you used earlier about um, looking outside the box not doing things that everyone does because sometimes you're just not aligned like that you know, you Absolutely. may, yeah, yeah, you're meant to create new things that hasn't happened before. <laughs> and that's why uh, <laughs> yeah. other yeah. things are, you know, doesn't work for most of us. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. I like that. That's a, that's a, that's a very uh, inspiring <laughs> story. 
I'll remember that one. I didn't know that story. I like it too. <laughs> the banana story. The banana girl. <laughs> I would. I will have. I will find her name. I'll find out about her name. I remember the name she used to bring up, but. Yeah. yeah. So what what um drawn I I know you mentioned about storytelling how it drawn you to do everything. Everything you do all you want just share stories. <laughs> but also you've been involved in um in politics. You're an activist in politics. Why that and how does it how does the and why is it important? Do you think young people will benefit to know more about politics? Absolutely. Um, the story is a little bit long, so I'll try to just cut to it. I, it landed on my lap. I was consulting for a TV network and the owner of the TV network um, and I were friends. And uh, I went to a dinner one night and then another fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. And uh, within that period, I got very close to people on her staff and I got very close to some very interesting people involved with her during that race. Mm-hmm. And I, I just... I was just super passionate uh, about her I'm with her movement and like what it stood for and the fact that she's going to be the first female president and just everything she was standing for and wanting to do for the country. um, I was extremely passionate about and that's all it was. I was never interested in politics before that. I was just passionate about this woman and I was passionate about uh, the state of our country and, 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 and how we could progress so much with just, that, ele- uh, that election in 2016, mm-hmm. uh, how we may have been able to uh, progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, it was in 2016, uh, early that year, middle, middle of that year, I don't really remember exactly right now, where I got involved and um, started fundraising for her. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we lost, I thought that everything I mean, it definitely affected me a lot because i'm thinking about it right now i'm just like oh, it was really a negative point in my life oh, yeah. sorry I'm like delusional almost that like there was no way she was gonna lose and i just I, I i i but anyway i learned so so much i learned that you know politics it's not what any of us really think there's so much more that has to go on to to make change happen. Making change happen is very, very difficult. There's a lot of compromise. Um, It's not as black and white as it seems. You can be, you know, super, super liberal, but fiscally conservative. And sometimes that makes no sense because it contradicts each other. And then sometimes it does make sense. And actually making some of the things that we want to happen, uh, happen is very difficult unless you do other things that you don't want to do. And so I learned a lot and I still have so much more to learn. But I think that experience uh, led me to, raising money and helping uh, other Democratic candidates for, you know, governor in certain states or senators or um, people running for president yeah. I've consulted for, um, that it's led me to those opportunities with that very first little experience with uh, the Clinton campaign in 2016. But no, no that that's, uh, that, that's such, it goes to the point that kind of what we've been talking about is that uh, our podcast is about culture, is about we, yeah. we, we spend time talking to people around the world about kind of their own upbringing. But pretty much since um, George Floyd's passing, it, our, our, our podcast is sort of um, sort of swayed to more political you know, aspects of it. And that's fine. You know, we're, we're using our platform to spread awareness and um, hold conversations for people. But it's it's going to be nice, hopefully, to to get back to talking about different people's experiences, you know, talk and just about getting food, food talk. and and oh, movies. That is so and, you know, there was a time, there was a time yeah. where I got so delusional because I thought everything was revol- was revolving around politics and like um, uh, just like what's happening. But I, I was I, I I came up with I, I actually came up with a concept with a friend of mine, a producer friend of mine, of a cooking show where we would tour the country and discuss politics. And when I look back at it today, I'm like, what was I ever thinking? Why am I going to ruin food by discussing right. politics with it? Like, no, we don't food, need to do that. We, we do need to educate people. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't need to educate people. Yeah. We, need to out, you know, we need to educate people about getting out the vote. We need to educate people on every issue. Mm-hmm. But we cannot make, we cannot consume our lives with that type of content anymore. Mm-hmm. We need to be educated and that definitely is important and i'm not taking away from that but we really need to also live a life outside of consuming ourselves with 
with, you know, yeah, with the negative negativity and the politics and yeah. all the and divisiveness yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And there's yeah. an appetite. Back to cooking shows that focus on cooking and maybe it's storytelling. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And pun intended, there is an appetite for that sort of content now. That yes. there's, you know, people are exhausted. There is a, a very real fatigue, you know, mm-hmm. talking about extensively ad nauseum politics and COVID mm-hmm. and all these things that are, are negative inherently. And um, yeah. I think people, people, I think all of us included, <laughs> we're just tired, just tired of talking about I it. I know. We took after the election on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We were dead for the next two days. We didn't do yeah. anything. Because Why? We just rested. Well, I mean, just, just resting. Our brains were like from, this for a whole week. Yeah, from Tuesday to Saturday, it's just like constantly refreshing your feed to see, you know, what Associated or uh, the Associated Press is saying, CNN saying, and finally they call it and it's like, okay, I'm going to turn off my phone, <laughs> turn off my phone for a couple of days, and hopefully they recover. I'm recovered. happy. Yeah, we're like we're happy. That, let's just rest. Let's take for this win at for least a bit two days. Then, take it in, yeah. digest it, and then uh, yeah, keep celebrating. <laughs> Well, I actually did. A, I actually had a different, you know, I agree with you. That's definitely how I felt. And I think a lot of us felt that way, but yeah. I could not take that anxiety anymore. I had so much anxiety this year that, um, which is a whole topic of its own. Um, but I could not experience the anxiety. So uh, that could have happened from this five day period or so. Mm-hmm. So I just completely checked out and, and, and I'm really busy with family right now. So I've just been completely busy with them and I would only check my phone or any news platform in the morning and at night. That's smart. Uh, and throughout the day, I just literally did not care because sometimes you have to not care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think. And so I literally, cause, cause you know, it, it could have been so, so bad. The, the alternative could have been really, really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, in your family, are you, are you are, you're first generation, right? I'm first generation, yeah. So do you have a story you can share with us from your grandparents and, and you know, tra- at home, the values, the tradition that, are, that you, you learned from your parents and grandparents? Yeah. I'll start off with the fact that my grandmother has been like the love of my life, my entire life. I was completely close to her. I learned Farsi um, through her. I was always around her and she did pass away last year. And it was the most like traumatizing. I don't know if the word is traumatizing, but just one of the most difficult experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't think I still haven't really mourned it because I probably can't. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, but anyway, we'll we'll stick to the positive. She was the most amazing human being ever. And um, she did, uh, suddenly died from a stroke last year and it was horrible, but um, she has taught me so much of anything that I know about my like heritage or culture or anything. Cause my parents are very, uh, another word I don't like to use, but they're very Americanized. They're very modern. I don't know if that's even the right word. They just, you know, they, they came here when they were really young uh-huh. and they just kind of adapted and just became Americans, which is what this country is. It's a yeah. bunch of, supposed to be a bunch of diverse people from all over the world who come here and are now this thing called American. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, there's don't really get that sometimes, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, they became, you know, they're from a different country and they came here and that's what they are. And so we, I grew up with them, but I half the time was with my grandparents, specifically my grandmother. And so anything I know about being Afghan, which is what I am ethnically, yeah. um, I have learned through her you know, primary mostly, uh, whether it was cooking. I mean, she was the most incredible cook ever. Mm. Uh, she is, she cooks some of the most amazing dishes ever, 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 oh, ever. Yeah. And, 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 uh, it's so funny. There are no Afghan restaurants in Los Angeles, really Los Angeles, like proper. So. There is not even one. Um, but, uh, she had, she taught me everything I needed to know about my like ethnicity and the culture around it. And she made me, uh, she like sewed me a bunch of little outfits when I was a baby all the way to when I was like, um, a teenager of just traditional clothing that Afghans wore. And I have it. Still. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. yeah. And my, yeah. And, uh, I've kept it until today and I'll, I'll always keep it. But, um, uh, yeah, so I feel like she's taught me whatever I know today regarding my ethnicity, like the food, um, just a little bit about like 
the background of that country. Yes. Obviously, Afghanistan is a very bizarre country. This mm. history is, yeah, yeah, it's intense. Bizarre thing. Start with my ethnicity. <laughs> I, come <from> a country. <laughs> I come from a country that's just been through so much war. Oh, God, <laughs> I, I can relate. I'm laughing at that. <laughs> Genocide war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, Afghans are really... Uh, Strong people, I hear. Mm -hmm. uh, They've never, never been. been defeated, huh? You never been. I've never been to Afghanistan. No, mm -hmm. I've been wanting to go multiple times. I actually started a project, one of my many projects I've started uh, that <laughs> yes. failed, uh, yes. was when I wanted to create this agency to uh, for for Americans to adopt Afghans, and I had all this funding and all of these people um, in California alone who wanted to adopt children from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I set up this whole thing. And apparently because of the Sharia law, it's a religious thing. They don't want people who are not Muslim or mm -hmm. maybe it's also Afghan and Muslim to adopt their children. Definitely. They have to be Muslim. So they're like, we're, we would rather our children die or be on the street than to like go mm -hmm. to the United States and whatever. So there's like a lot of issues like that, which I'm sure you're kind of familiar with, yeah. you know, Asia and Africa have a lot of similar things going on with their like rules and especially if they're Muslim countries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I tried they were, like, I remember everyone was like, you're starting a bloodbath. Is this going to cause a war or whatever? And so, um, oh. so I was going to go during that period and then I did not because they're like, you're going to go and you're going to get killed because what you're trying to do is like not going to be yeah. okay. To um, and so that, that wasn't a, that wasn't a win. That was kind of a failure, mm -hmm. but um, during that period, I learned a lot about the country and kind of mm -hmm. like the politics and all. What I will say is with Afghanistan is like, I am so grateful for my family. They're so incredible. And, you know, I've learned some things and, and I know that our culture is what's helped them and shaped them be, become who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, the food is amazing. But I feel like culturally, I am more American than anything else. And so yeah. I, I have much to add to that. Uh, but it, but I'm willing to answer any questions you might have. You might be able to bring say something that I might think of. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. Do you do you have like your grandma's recipes like that? Oh, I'm saying. glad you brought that up. So, there, you know, like I said, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff um, in my family right now. There's uh, there's been so much good this year and so much yeah sanity yeah. And, and sadness and craziness. So um, there's been kind of like a family crisis going on but it's all good now mm -hmm. and to get my family together i've decided that like as a project we should uh create a cookbook and a lot of the recipes should be my grandmother's recipes in there mm -hmm. and we should like create it and, and 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 talk to everyone in the family and like try to get all her recipes as close to what she made as possible and I, all her kids though my uncles and aunts and my dad mm -hmm. um definitely know uh, most of her recipes and how she made it and like what it is so i'm definitely gonna Aww. make my little projects and like you know self um publish oh, the book <clears throat> and so yeah she made the most amazing food i mean when i think about it i always people always ask me like what's your favorite food you know when you meet someone new or whoever you always on time people talk about that yeah. and i i would always forget about afghan food which is my own like food right yeah. and uh, lately my cousins were all over and we were like you know have, asking each other what our favorite foods are because we're all trying to like you know go out and eat in LA, which is always a difficult process because everything here is so disgusting. <laughs> like, like all the restaurants here are just for show. Like they're fancy and interesting looking and like all about like the buzz and the vibe. Mm. It's not that great. So mm. we were like, let's cook something. And then they all said their favorite food was Afghan food. And I'm like, wow, my favorite food is Afghan food. And I feel like the world has yet to experience what Afghan food is. It's not a very common, you know, cuisine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Big you're stuff. saying that I don't think I've ever had. No, Afghan I never food. had it before. Have you guys had Ethiopian food? Yes, yeah, yeah. we have. I like Ethiopian food. It's not similar, but there are things that remind me of it. Like, I feel like we can make Afghan food Ethiopian style. You know how Ethiopians have multiple different dishes in one? Mm -hmm. Also have like a bunch of side dishes with like a couple main dishes. And so I feel like uh, if someone were to ever open a, you know, Afghan restaurant, it would be extremely successful for them to style it in the way that Ethiopians do, like the variety. Oh, yeah, I can uh, imagine. That would be so, I'm thinking about the spices though. Like yeah. the amount of different, the variety of spices. Yeah. Because um, there's, you know, you say there's no comparison, but Ethiopian food, the, the amount of spices and just the variety. And yeah. I'm an eater. I'm from Texas. I learned how to eat from a very young age. <laughs> that, that's Stop a very, very yeah, that's a very exciting uh, yeah. concept for me. 
if you could leave one message to our audience or anybody who listens um, that would benefit the most in life, um, what do you think that would be? Like, what would you say to anybody that, you know, may be struggling with something, yeah. uh, you know, whatever? What do you think that you would say to them? Young or old or? It's simple, but I think, I hope, uh, helpful to people. Um, and that's a day without laughter is a day wasted. And what I mean by that is uh, no matter what you're going through every single day, no matter what, you have to find a reason to laugh, hopefully all day throughout the day, but never, ever, ever take things too seriously and don't overthink. And I feel like that is all bundled up with a day without laughter is a day wasted because a lot of us are taking things way too seriously. We should all be so blessed to wake up in the morning. It really does come down to that simplicity of we're so grateful that we're literally human. Like what is being human? Like I still don't get it. Like what are we? <laughs> yeah. It's so amazing. Don't get like, don't get all wrapped up in the insanity of existing and surviving and living this big question mark that we're living this is all a huge question mark but the fact that we're living it is such a blessing don't forget to laugh every single day and the good thing is with the dean <laughs> i'm laughing because she's always laughing and so we need to laugh <laughs> it's, it's true <laughs> you're right. i remember at um, our job Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize you were you were one of the bosses. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So then the job begins, and I realize you're you know you're the boss. I'm like, what, 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 what happened here? <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna treat him like my boss, mm-hmm. but you never had that attitude either. You never took anything serious, and I think some people sometimes it can be confusing to people. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but not being angry at things all the time it does not mean you don't care. Yeah, yeah, because you really, really cared, and I remember we always talked about you, and it's like you know even at work when there were like some hard things to do, you went and do it. You didn't. You, you want to do things and and just being you know vulnerable uh, which is another big concept <laughs> yeah. vulnerability and the way you treat people with kindness and and realizing wait a minute my kindness is being taken uh, for granted and also pull yourself back I think I it, it was nine weeks was it six weeks how many weeks you were there I did six and a half. Yeah, I did learn a lot, and I and and uh, I really was, you know, I was glad that our path crossed. So. I was too. I appreciate that so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people didn't know you, and they, <laughs> they were like, "Samir, he left." It's like, yes, but they didn't understand who you were, and for some reason, the few times uh, I we I spent with you, and I think there was a, a few times we spent three of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah we got to know you so thank you for leaving that you know with us so. yeah <laughs> thank I, you both this is a great uh hour and some minutes that we spent together and yes. i'd love to catch up with you guys uh soon absolutely all right folks that's it that was good yeah it was it was nice right it was, it was inspiring. good it was lighthearted. Yeah, and we yeah. learned about African food and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, folks, thank you so much for joining us in the season finale, the wrap of season two. Yeah. Um, we will be back stronger than ever with season three. I know. I can't wait for that. We have a great lineup. Yeah. You know, like we've already started interviews for season three, and we can't wait. The season season three comes out March eighth. Uh, March eighth. I think March 8th and it's going to be an incredible female. We're not going to tell you the name, but we hope you're able <laughs> to listen to yeah, it. <laughs> right. Uh, so pl- yeah, yeah. Stay, stay tuned to that. Um, and uh, we of course appreciate everybody's support mm-hmm. and yes. their love and all the love comments. You back. And, oh yeah. All yeah. the support. It's really, it's incredible. You mm-hmm. helped us go through this whole pandemic and yeah. and we're very grateful. We, um, yeah, we'll see you soon. See you soon. In March. Oh, happy Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, until next time, until, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs>